to another rousing episode of Xylogamoto. Okay, maybe rousing isn't the right word, unless you have a thing for terrible Mega Drive games. But hopefully this episode will at least be informative. Today we're going to be looking at a very large-sized Mega Drive 101 fighting game weighing in at 24 megabits. This game is also known as, well, not being too great. Are we talking about Shaq Fu? Nope, I already did that one back in Season 1, Episode 15. Also, spoiler alert, Shaq Fu is actually not bad, at least on the Genesis rather than the Super Nintendo. No, instead we're looking at another 24 megabit one-on-one -on -one fighting game with a poor reputation. And that game is... Rise of the Robots. As you can see from the cover and why I specifically mentioned the Mega Drive earlier rather than the Genesis, this is a Mega Drive release. And there's a reason for that. Even though the Game Gear, 3DO, CDI, SNES, Amiga, and DOS versions of the game were released in the United States, the Mega Drive version was exclusively released in Europe. Further confusing things, the SNES version was not released in Europe, and was instead released in the United States and Japan only. So figure that one out, I can't. I'd always assumed that Rise of the Robots came out for the Genesis, so I was very surprised when I was looking for a copy of the game on eBay a few weeks ago to find out about its European exclusive status. Due to Street Fighter 2 and Mortal Kombat blowing up in the arcades in the early 90s, the mid-90s were filled with all sorts of one-on-one -on -one fighting games to capitalize on the popularity of the genre. At the top of this list, you had other titles from Capcom besides Street Fighter 2, along with releases from SNK of Neo Geo fame fighting for their share of the pie. And while Capcom and SNK were clearly the best at attempting to at least match if not outdo Street Fighter 2, they certainly weren't the only ones, and many developers that didn't have the arcade background of those two titans attempted to release to directly to consoles instead. However, the key to getting noticed when you don't have an arcade version to create awareness of your title was to have a hook, something that looks sharp in advertisements and to sell to kids. Developer Mirage came up with a hook for their game to be a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that featured robots as characters, something that I only remember being done in one other title, Capcom Cyberbots, which would come after Rise. However, there was one key difference between those two titles, and that was that Rise of the Robots would feature characters created and rendered in 3D Studio, giving the game a very unique, futuristic look. Rise of the Robots was released between late 94 and early 95 for all of its various versions, with the Mega Drive version appearing towards the end in February of 1995. It's possible due to 1995 being fairly late in the Genesis product cycle and the Saturn appearing just a few months later, Acclaim decided it wasn't worth the effort to publish the game in the United States due to its expensive size, but who knows. Regardless, it means that I get to pull up my trusty region modded Genesis to play Rise of the Robots in PAL mode as originally intended. And I'll do that in just a second, but first, Let's take a look at this freshly imported package. Okay, here is Rise of the Robots, and you can immediately see the game has the blue late release Mega Drive style label, as opposed to the red Genesis late release label. Also, it is actually still in a clamshell case too, as opposed to a cardboard box. This is pretty common for acclaimed titles, even in the United States, as I assume they just had a massive strategic reserve of clamshells but it was also common for late Mega Drive releases in general. Just on a cursory search of later Mega Drive Genesis releases that came in cardboard boxes in the United States, the only ones I was able to find that also came in a cardboard box in Europe was Sonic and Knuckles. I'm sure there are others, but the clamshell was definitely the norm on Mega Drive titles, even late in the game. This case isn't great, but it's not terrible. It's certainly seen better days, as it's got a chunk missing from the upper corner on the front, and it's a bit scratched up on the surface, but for the most part, it's intact. Of course, minus the circumcised hang tab at the top. No major holes or rips to the outside, and the inner cover is in good shape minus a scuff at the top, but no sun bleaching or water damage. Honestly, with this game's reputation, I wasn't looking for a perfect copy, just one that wasn't beat to shit, so this is fine. As far as the actual cover goes, I like it for the most part. I don't think the graphics were ever specifically the complaint about this game, and that follows with the cover, as the logo at the top is sharp, 
if not maybe a little small in the second line, and your character, the oh-so-imaginatively named Cyborg, is front and center, and very blue. They probably could have done better with the background and had, I, I don't know, something there besides just plain bare blackness, but I think that was done on purpose to try to emphasize that Queen guitarist Brian May was associated with the title. This is a bit of a stretch and borders on false advertising, but we'll get into that more into the actual review portion. Just a quick note about the spine. I'm sorry, but this is cluttered as hell. Having four logos here is just too much. In the US, Sega didn't put their name on the spine unless it was a first party title, so I don't know why they felt the need to do that in Europe, but I digress. On the back, it's a mess, like the European releases usually are, having to cater to six languages. Good luck reading any of that text from more than six inches away. However, I do like the fact that there's 12 screenshots on the back, with six from the game scenes and one for each of the enemies. They really catered to the game's strength, which was the graphics. Also, I find it interesting that the age rating for the game is on the back rather than on the front. Seems kind of odd, but that's probably just because I'm used to it always being on the front. Opening the box up, and the cartridge is in good shape. The manual, eh, a bit less so, with the cover definitely being a bit bent up. But, like I said earlier, I wasn't looking for a perfect copy, just an intact one. Interesting thing here, even though the back of the box only has six languages, the manual actually covers eight, and except for the intro section, each language gets its own section in the manual, rather than having to share pages. Per language, the manual's pretty short, but that's okay, as the game isn't very deep, with it really just being a one-on-one -on -one fighter with minimal options. I especially like how even though there's not a ton to discuss, that the manual is thorough in describing each of the robots, and listing their special moves. And it's a solid graphic layout, although they probably could have used larger pictures of each of the robots, rather than the in-game insets. Okay, enough about the package, let's see how accurate this game's reputation is, or if perhaps we have another diamond in the rough, like with Shaq Fu. Oh boy, this, this is a game, in a very, very loose interpretation of the word game, anyway. So where do we start? Well, I guess with the basics. Rise of the Robots, at its core, is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. However, to differentiate it from the average mid-90s 101 fighter, the designers went with two things fairly uncommon to the genre. Characters that weren't human, or that had humanoid forms, and a setting that takes place in the future. Both of these combined to give Rise of the Robots a decidedly futuristic sci-fi feel that was much less Enter the Dragon and more Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And it's impossible to look at Rise of the Robots analytically and not think of Terminator 2. I'm not saying Rise of the Robots wouldn't exist without Terminator 2, but if it did, I think it would appear much different. And while that might not be obvious from the surface, via looking at the cover or various screenshots, if you think about it, it's easy to pick up a few similarities. First off, both are sci-fi titles that heavily involve the future. Then, both titles involve machines quote-unquote going bad in the future. Now, granted, T2 has the machines turning via self-awareness versus Rise of the Robots premise that somehow a virus managed to cause the damage, but the end result is the same, an army of robots that want to take over the world. Finally, the main antagonist in T2 is the T1000, a morphing android made out of a liquid alloy similar to Mercury, which allows it to take the forms of other people and mimic them. And the main antagonist in Rise of the Robots is the supervisor droid, which can morph into the forms of any of the other robots via a, from the manual, polymetamorphic titanium alloy. It's like they cheated off the smart kid in class to get a decent grade on the test, but in reality had no clue what they were actually doing. However, just for full disclosure's sake, let's discuss the actual plot of the game in a little more detail and then show how that relates to what you can do, and not do, in the game. So apparently, and I'm getting some of this information from the internet because the manual is a bit limited in background information due to the space limitations of covering eight languages, 
But in 2043, a company called Electrocorp has created a massive factory for creating robots called Metropolis 4. Electrocorp makes, surprise surprise, robots and androids. Metropolis 4 is apparently such a huge facility that the supervisor droid, aka the T-1000, was created to manage the plant, being far away their most advanced creation. Except for their other most advanced creation, the Eco-35-2 Cyborg, which is an android paired with a human brain. Anyway, this sets up the plot with your character having the only chance of stopping the uprising because your human brain isn't susceptible to the eco-virus or supervisor control. Here's where the game goes from T2 to goofy Roger Corman B-movie. And again, this all comes from the internet. None of what follows is in the manual, other than the Eco-35-2 having a human brain. So, apparently, in the Metropolis 4 Revolt, all of the humans were slaughtered, including the Electrocorp CEO. Why does this matter? Well, because apparently the brain in Eco-35-2 is a clone of the CEO's brain. So, now Eco-35-2 a.k.a. you, wants revenge on the supervisor for the death of his quote-unquote father. Except, if he's a clone, shouldn't he want revenge for the supervisor killing himself? I think I just took a star off the rating for that plot description alone. Based on all that, you as the Eco-35-2 is on a mission to destroy the supervisor and end the revolt. But to do that, you'll have to go through hundreds of thousands of infected robot... Wait. Hang on. This can't be right. This is the world's largest robot factory that has been compromised. But apparently, you only have to defeat five robots to get to the supervisor. Now, I get it. This isn't a beat-em-up or a shooter. No one's going to want to go through hundreds of waves of defeating the same robots over and over again. But seven total combatants? In the entire game? Even the original Mortal Kombat had a total of nine characters, not including Reptile, and that game came out over two and a half years before this. Now, I understand why this is. Beyond the plot, the gotcha for Rise of the Robots was supposed to be the high level of graphics. Each of the seven characters was created in 3D Studio with the goal of producing games featuring sprites based on those 3D renders, rather than traditional hand-drawn animation similar to what Rare did with Donkey Kong Country about the same time. And to be fair, the graphics do have a unique look to them, or at least the character sprites do. Everything else about the in-game graphics are incredibly pedestrian, with a few basic menus and level backgrounds that are as exciting and as detailed as an empty robot warehouse. To make matters worse, even the 3D rendered animation of the characters is limited, this may not be exact, but I'm pretty sure each of the characters' standing animation consists of about four frames, which then leads me to the question of, where did all the space go? This is a 24 megabit cart, and Shaq Fu looks like an anime compared to this. There is an intro video, heavily compressed and in about four colors, and I'd hope there's a similar ending video, so maybe that's where some of it went? And also, each character has a small inset intro video showing how the character was originally rendered in 3D Studio, but I just don't get it. Reading into the development of the game a bit, it sounds like that porting the game away from the Amiga to consoles was a bit difficult, so perhaps the extra space was a band-aid to allow the game to be completed without too much re-engineering. Regardless, the phrase, bigger isn't always better, is definitely apt in this case. One area that I can't complain about too much is the in-game music. Oh, I'll still complain, don't worry, but for the most part, the in-game music is pretty good. Is it the best background music I've ever heard? No, but it does fit the game well, and the instrumentation isn't too shrill or noisy. However, it sounds like an average 16-bit game music. Here's where I have to complain a bit, though. If you remember, the cover of the game includes a note about how the game features music from Brian May. And this is sort of true. The game features one track from Brian May, or more specifically, a partial reinterpretation of one track of May's The Dark from his Back into the Light album, 
whereas the rest of the game's soundtrack is originally composed material, not by Brian May. Now, while they're technically correct that the game includes music by Brian May, I think I really would have left this detail off the 16-bit version of the game, because it's just the one song, and you have to really know what you're listening for to pick this out. While the in-game music comes off as pretty decent, the sound effects are mediocre at best. Not exactly a ton of variety, and mainly just a lot of metal crashing. The sound effects aren't bad, mind you, but there's just not a ton of them. Overall, the in-game audio isn't bad, and doesn't specifically detract from the game, but it doesn't do much to elevate the game either, it's just kinda there. This is honestly a problem a lot of games have from this era, it's not just Rise of the Robots, but when the rest of the game is as poor as it is, it needs all the help it can get, and no aid is coming on the audio front. Like most games on the Genesis slash Mega Drive, Rise of the Robots works best when you utilize the 6-button controller. However, the controls are so poor, it really doesn't matter what controller you use. Hell, you could probably plug an old Atari 2600 joystick in and have roughly the same experience. In an ideal setting, the controls are the same as Street Fighter 2, with the X, Y, and Z buttons functioning as light through hard kick, and likewise for A, B, and C for light through hard punch. When using a three button controller, the start button will switch the buttons between punch and kick. Except there's no jumping punch. When standing or crouching, pressing a punch button punches as you would expect. But when jumping? Yeah, it doesn't matter if you press punch or kick, you're gonna do the same jump kick for both. Also, in a game like Street Fighter 2, your light punch graphically appears different than a medium or hard punch with different frames of animation. Right as for the robots? Nope. You effectively have one punch and one kick, and it just moves slightly quicker or slower depending on the strength, and yet another area where the designers cut corners on this game. However, one good thing I can mention here is that in the Mega Drive version, there is a button for each attack. Why do I mention this? Well, apparently in certain other versions of the game, it instead relied on upon a power gauge, which related back to how long you held the various attack button down for, and this power gauge would display below your health. This type of control scheme is more common on consoles with limited buttons. For instance, there are several Neo Geo games that use a similar timed button attacks, like the Art of Fighting series. Any game I've ever played with a similar setup has always come off as frustrating and difficult to play, so I suppose it's nice that Rise of the Robots on the Mega Drive is frustrating and difficult to play for completely different reasons. The primary reason why the game is frustrating is due to a design choice that developers made on purpose. They wanted the game to have an advanced AI that would put their game ahead of games like Street Fighter 2 or Mortal Kombat. However, what they actually implemented wasn't necessarily an advanced AI, as much it was one where the computer just simply blocks 95% of the time, which combined with the reach and strength advantages on any robot after the first two, makes the game absolutely impossible. I actually read online where some people are of the mindset that playing the game in hard is actually easier than easy, due to the fact the computer blocks slightly less in hard to make up for the other difficulty increases, and all I can say is that when players actually think that easy and hard difficulties are flipped, you have one seriously foobard product. Rise of the Robots is also frustrating simply just due to how the game works. The game consists of three modes. The standard single player mode, where you attempt to defeat the six other robots in the game. A practice mode, where you can practice fighting against the first five robots, but not the supervisor droid. And then a two player game mode. The single player mode is what you'd expect from one of these types of games, and you control the amount of rounds and time limit length via the option screen. However, in just another thing this game screws up, the game features no continues. Lose to the computer once? Oh, not only are you going to have to go all the way back to the beginning, you're going to have to go all the way back to the blue Sega screen, and then have to go through all of the introductory screens to get back to the game and start again. I honestly can't say I've ever seen a fighting game screw up continuing this badly. The practice mode is just as bad, and the same thing occurs. Never mind the fact that it's 
practice mode, and the whole point is you're going to be playing multiple rounds to try to get better. They thought it necessary for you to restart the entire game after a loss. Finally, the two-player versus mode is just as screwed up as the rest of the game. So I guess at least they were consistently poor with the design. In the two-player mode, the first player is always a cyborg, and the second player can choose from one of the other five robots, or six if you enter code to enable the supervisor. Now, I understand not necessarily having character versus character. I don't like it, but other games have done that. But to lock the first player to just the cyborg, and then the second player to everyone but the cyborg? I'm just at a loss. It's like they were actively trying to make the game not fun to play, in all modes. All in all, Rise of the Robots gets zero stars from me, and is a certified bomb. It is by far the worst game I've played this year, and not only that, it is the worst game I've reviewed so far on Xylogamoto, period. At least games like American Gladiators and Bake My Video, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch were mildly interesting even though they were deeply flawed. Rise of the Robots, on the other hand, feels like a beta that managed to get shipped to market. I wouldn't be surprised if the reason why it never made it to the Genesis was because Sega of America took one look at it and was like, a claim, we've let you release lots of trash, but this is where we draw the line. Nintendo can take the hit on this one. And if you absolutely have to play this game, I'd recommend taking a look at the Amiga version, as the music and graphics are vastly improved with many additional cinema sequences that didn't make it into this version. But don't expect much. Okay, that was Rise of the Robots, and I think I need to go take a shower, as I feel dirty from all that. Just one of the worst experiences I've ever had playing a game. And, of course, it's completely my fault because I searched out and had this game shipped to me when a sane person would have left it to hell in Europe and spent that money on, well, pretty much anything else. I'd be really interested to see if I come across any other game that I consider this poor over the next thousand episodes or so. Because, right now, Rise of the Robots is the king of Ship Mountain. Tune in next week when I turn my focus back to the Master System and take a look at a Sega arcade classic that I've gotten a new appreciation of recently due to being able to play a pixel-perfect version of it in Sega's Yakuza 0 on the Xbox. And if you play newer titles and you like beat-em-ups, definitely give Yakuza 0 a look. It's very interesting, and the game looks especially gorgeous, especially on Xbox One X. Remember, whatever you like to play, have fun and be excellent to each other. Later.